Hello, uh, good morning, everyone out there in the world, and welcome to History Matters. And so does coffee. Um, today's that's yes. I was going to say thank you, Annie. I'm going to change the view here so I can see everybody better. Okay. Um, so today, uh, you know, I, I actually we're now at the point. This is the 186th straight episode we are now at the point where i have to go scrolling through past episodes to be like when was the last time i said anything like this and when i said something like this what did i say so um there's like extra bonus work involved here to try and figure out and i have talked around this topic before um threats as politics but i haven't talked about them in the way i'm going to talk about them today um but before i get into that um i turn to my partner in crime annie who will explain the rules of the game. Good morning, everybody. I'm Annie Evans from New American History, and I'm delighted to be with you guys. Uh, we are going to have about a 30-minute conversation. Joanne's going to share um, with us, and then while she's doing that, feel free to chat away, those of you who are with us on Zoom. But if you have questions about today's topic, they need to go in the Q&A. So that's located near the bottom of your screen. Please put your questions in the Q&A. In about 30 minutes, I'll be back and we will have a talk. See you in a little bit. And uh, if you are here uh, for the first time or the second time, or if you are a new person here, um, please say so in chat and you will get a robust welcome from the History Matters community after 185 episodes, we are a community. Um, and I hope you'll join us and keep coming back. Um, okay, threats as politics. Um, so obviously, <laughs> at least obvious to me, uh, part of what got me going on this topic is what we're seeing happen in relation to uh, the inability to pick to elect a speaker for the House of Representatives, and in particular, um, Jim Jordan's continued attempt to become Speaker. And there has been, before the last day or two, um, there had been murmuring about um, what a number of media outlets are calling hardball tactics. Um, and, it, there, you know, there had been I didn't go and find the precise quotes from the newspapers, but I read uh, some Republicans, you know, sort of saying he, he, he said things in private and it made me gasp. I have no idea what that is. I'm assuming it happened, but I don't know that for sure. But what certainly it would be in character for Jim Jordan to be abrasive and abrupt, right? That's kind of his brand. Um, but at any rate, uh, what brought me to today's topic uh, is the fact that now in the last few days, we're hearing about um, Republicans who have voted against him for speaker getting threats, threatening um, phone calls, death threats, uh, being doxxed in a variety of different ways. Anyway, threats, let's just use the word threats, threats is politics, um, but real threats like credible, seemingly credible threats. And we even, there's even one that you can hear uh, floating around online, again, assuming that this is accurate. Um, however, the larger point I have here has to do with the nature of these threats versus the general world of um, some on the right using threats of violence to get their way. Um, I, when I went, I think yesterday, I had a, a little burst of um, outrage at this whole idea of threats being sent to members of Congress to change their votes. And I did as I probably shouldn't do, but always do, which is went on to the 800 social media platforms that I'm still on at the moment uh, and said, you know, vented about why I thought this was a big problem. Um, and, you know, for all of the reasons why social media is problematic or can be problematic. One of the things that I find interesting about it is that it's an interesting indicator of some of the general ideas, general sentiment that's floating around in the world. And I'll explain what I mean right now. So I beam out and I say, this isn't normal, right? I think it was, uh, 
an interview, uh, maybe on CNN, with a Republican member of Congress saying he had received death threats. And I said, this isn't normal. Actually, all capital letters, this isn't normal. And I got a lot of responses, and this, not just on um, the platform formerly known as Twitter, um, but on others as well, more friendly, normal platforms, um, from people who were not, um, they were not angry or outraged. They were just saying, actually, very calmly, well, this is what they do. Right. This is what a certain segment of the right does. They're violent. They use threats. They've been doing it for a long time. Why is this a surprise? It's not a surprise in a way. It's normal because it's normal for them. This did not make me happy. Um, this is what drove me to pick this topic for today, because on the one hand, they're absolutely right. People saying that. Right. I mean, we can all say, yes, we've been watching for several years. Uh, violence, threats, like actually carried out violence, but also um, threats, you know, people being, their cars being pushed off the road or whatever. We could we could make a string if we wanted to. This could be a classroom with a blackboard and we could list all of the ways in which we recall violence being imposed against people who some on the far right think are getting in their way. And I'm gonna come back eventually to the left um, because I know out in the world, and actually I saw online people saying, you know, left, it's the left that's violent. Yeah, um, no. <laughs> but we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Um, they're totally a different animal. But at any rate, um, so there has been a lot of violence. And this is kind of um, in the nature of what a certain kind of Republican is and has been consistently doing. I even went online and got figures here, um, just about members of Congress. So um, in 2022, the US Capitol Police recorded more than 9,000 threats against members of Congress. 9,000 threats against members of Congress. Um, that was offered by the uh, Chief of Police of the Capitol Police during a Senate Rules Committee hearing. Um, that is, a surge of about 400% in the last six years. So we have been living in that climate and we have been seeing that not just with members of Congress, but out in the world, right? Um, I, this morning, I, I couldn't help but think of um, Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman, right? There are people who um, the president spoke out against them and then they're being threatened and they're having to hide um, that's more of the same brand of politics. So this is not new. However, um, what we're watching to me feels different. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. I want to talk briefly or even review briefly um, the amazing power of threats of politics. The thing about threats is that you don't actually have to be violent for them to work for them to have power. Um, you only have to be credibly threatening, right? It's sort of an, an easy way, a brutal and easy way to have power. You don't have to do anything. You just have to sound threatening and credibly be a threat. We've seen enough violence in a variety of different ways in the last, what was the figure here? Um, six years, that any threat is going to have that ring of credibility to it, right? So what that means is a death threat, um, you're going to be less likely, <laughs> I don't know, generally if people laugh off death threats, but they're going to have a, a, a more of a sense of truth to them rather than, well, this is an angry person calling me whatever. And that's the power of threats. They don't require action at all if you're in a climate climate or place where they're credible. And that's one of the things that's at the heart of my last book, The Field of Blood, about violence in Congress, is that a lot of what was happening in Congress, Southerners versus Northerners concerning slavery, was threats. Not, And there was a lot of violence, and I wrote about the violence, but even more than that, there were threats. I, I couldn't, I didn't even try to track the threats. There's just too much. 
And the power of that, and you, I could see it again and again and again in the antebellum Congress, is that um, Northerners felt that if they said something the wrong way or did something the wrong way concerning a Southerner, and that Southerner sort of glared at them in the wrong way, bad things might happen. The Southerner didn't even necessarily have to say, um, you know, you're, you're looking down a dual challenge, buddy. That was very clear in the air. So the idea that Southerners tend to be armed, were very willing to engage in man-to-man -man violence, were seemingly happy to duel, none of these things being common among Northerners, that was a sort of threat in the air that shaped voting on the floor of Congress. So that's a specific example of threats as politics, right? That, that And again, the importance of it is that you don't have to do anything violent. You just have to be believable in the threat, right? People need to believe that, ooh, this could actually happen. And the last six years have been helping us assume that. Now, in addition, and I don't know if you knew this before, I didn't know this before. Um, in addition to this growing sort of violence cloud that is now hovering constantly over poli our politics and our nation in one way or another, um, there's the fact that there are a number of traditionally conservative Republicans in the House who, how do I put this? haven't necessarily been threatened, but tend to comply. Um, and this is what surprised me this morning, that apparently um, conservative Republicans in the House who tend to ultimately give in are called by some squishes, squishes, like squish, like soft, like they're not hard and that they give in for compromise. I had not heard that before. Um, you just go Google squishes and you'll see it being talked about all over the place. Of course, the first thing I thought of was um, fighting men and, and non-compliant, uh, uh, non-combatants, which I talk about in my book, right? Certain people are non-combatants, they're just not going to engage in this. And I thought squish, squish is perhaps, a you know, our moment's equivalent of that. But regardless, squishes are Republicans who are willing to compromise. And sometimes that means with the other party, with Democrats, heaven forbid that anyone engage in the actual process of debate and compromise, which is what's supposed to happen. Okay, so we have the sort of ethos of violence. We have um, people in Congress, Republicans in Congress, who, um, and we've seen, seemingly are just going with the flow. How many times have you thought to yourself, say something, why won't the Republicans stand up and say something? And generally speaking, for the most part, a lot of them haven't. There's the atmosphere. And now we have this moment where there's violence being thrown around. I think there probably was an assumption and certainly the press thinks that there was an assumption on the part of um, Jim Jordan and his allies that the squishes would squish and ultimately give in. Um, but here's what's interesting about these threats. Uh, some people are saying, and I, I have a couple of them here, some people are saying that the Republicans who won't support Jordan, um, that this has gone too far, that in one way or another, he's encouraged this, they're being bullied, and they don't want to vote for a bully. So again, I you know, none of us can predict what's going to happen in so many ways. And I gather that there's going to be a third vote for speaker today at some point, maybe now, actually, I think I read that it was at 10 o'clock. Um, so you guys will know what's happening before I do. Um, but at any rate, um, some people are assuming that Jordan and his allies um, are responsible in one way or another for encouraging it or for not stepping forward enough to stop it, that's kind of where we are right now. And, and that's, you know, I one of the things I went this morning to look up was, okay, is that is that really true? Are there Republicans who believe that Jordan in one way or another is helping to 
encourage, um, I, I don't want to say coordinate, which is probably too strong a word, but in one way or another is behind some of this threatening behavior. And there certainly are a number of Republicans, anti-Jordan Republicans, who are saying that. Um, a spokesperson for Jordan said that, of course, you know, he isn't behind any of the attacks. I, I gather that he sent maybe out a, a text, not a text, a, a tweet. I think that's still where he's, who knows, tweet, skeet, post, whatever, um, saying this is bad, it should stop. Um, and this is a quote from um, the spokesperson for Jordan. Mr. Jordan hasn't made any threats or encouraged any attacks on any members voting against him or encouraged any attacks in any way, neither has our team. Now, Republican members of Congress aren't generally believing that, or at least some of them, let me put it that, let me back that up. Some Republican members who are opposing Jordan don't necessarily believe that because what's happening is um, seemingly carrying out the kind of politics that um, Jordan and his allies seemingly routinely engage in, meaning, you know, I, I hate the fact that the media is calling this hardball politics as though there's anything normal about this. There isn't. Um, but there's a um, Florida Republican who says, quote, that, that Jordan is, quote, absolutely responsible for it, and it doesn't work. Nobody likes to have their arm twisted or talking about individuals' wives because some of the wives of members of Congress are getting threats. That's just not acceptable. And there are other people of the, I guess now it's 22 members of Congress, uh, Republican members of the, of the House who didn't support Jordan, um, who were saying, I don't like to be bullied. I'm not going to vote for a bully. And he's a bully. And so now, again, um, the press, which that's its own issue, and we can have another discussion of the press at some point. Um, but now they're saying, like, maybe this backfired, right? Maybe it was a too hard hardball politics, and that these 22 are now going to be so angry at being attacked in this way that they're really not going to vote for Jordan. Um, at any rate, what I want to say and where I started out is, yes, that kind of strategy is believable in this moment. It's why these threats feel credible. Yes, we've been seeing people on the right threaten violence, use violence. We've seen and heard violence of all kinds coming from lots of people. So all the people who responded on social media and said, yeah, well, yeah, right, this isn't normal, Freeman. Well, it is now because uh, some on the right do it all the time. It's very normal. What do you expect? It's what they do. Here's why that, that upsets me and makes me want to scream. Several reasons. Number one, what it says is that we have already normalized that violence. If people are saying, well, yeah, that's what they do, what do you expect? Think about that. We've already normalized it. We may say we don't like it, but if you're saying, well, yeah, that's what they do, on a certain level, you are saying that's just how they conduct politics. Oh, well, just think about the logic of that. Think about how normalized that behavior has become the same thing. If it's being called hardball politics, think about how normalizing that is, as though death threats are just a normal way of engaging in a democratic politics. It's not normal. And number two, what we're seeing now is different in kind, if not degree, these death threats. And here's why I say that. It's one thing to be intimidating and threatening and want people to, for example, be unwilling to be on school boards or unwilling to work at polling places. Um, those are some of the things that we see all the time. It's another thing for there to be, and I can't say it's coordinated, but certainly it's all happening at the same time right now, for there to be a bunch of people using threats of violence to influence a vote a live vote in Congress and affect who will be Speaker of the House. Yes, it's violent. Yes, it's in the same character as what we've been seeing before. This is different 
because it's violence woven into our, our democratic process, our government, the structure of government. What we're seeing is people trying to use violence to appoint a speaker of the house. That is what we're seeing. That's not just violence. That's violence being woven into the structure of our government, the infrastructure of our government, the infrastructure of Congress. That matters a lot. And in a way we've become so used to all of the other violence that as I saw on all of these social media platforms, People are saying, well, yeah, we see this all the time. It's normal. It's not normal. It's not normal at all. The violence isn't normal. But to say that people giving death threats to members of Congress who don't want to give the speakership in the House to somebody, people thinking that that's a valid way to affect a vote. And think about this, right? Some of them are coming forward and saying, like, you know, we're being threatened and thank heaven that they are because it's entirely possible that they could be entirely silent and this could be happening behind the scenes and Jordan could suddenly get votes and poof, he'd be speaker and we wouldn't know what's going on. We wouldn't know that people change their votes because they're being threatened. Their lives are being threatened. Their wives are being threatened. They wouldn't know. We wouldn't know. And then some Joanne Freeman of the future who dig and find all these threats and come up with a pattern and expose it. That's essentially what my book did, right? I dug in the past, I was like, wait a minute, there's all these threats of violence and we haven't seen it before because it was essentially censored out of the period's equivalent of the congressional record. So you don't see it, you don't see it. But when you know it's there and you look for it, holy smoke, it's everywhere. That future Joanne Freeman would do what I did. Wait, wait. There's so much violence woven into how Congress was working in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s. Now, what we're, I'm not saying, as so many people have, and as I, maybe at, in at least one op-ed sort of suggested, oh, we're in the 1850s again. This is like another 1850s moment. I don't like those kinds of um, links between past and present. I don't like to say it's the 1850s again, because on the one hand, it, it encourages people to think, oh, well, we got through it last time, we'll get through it this time. And on the other hand, it helps to blind people to the ways in which what's happening now is different. There are no two political crises that are the same and the differences really matter. So we can say that there are similarities to what we it happened in the 1850s to what's going on now. It's not the same thing. Um, at any rate, my main point here, and it, it's, part of a response to the many responses I saw to my simple statement that it's not normal. Death threats to members of Congress is not normal. Um, that people, you know, and again, the members of Congress said that, that they're getting these phone calls um, from people who are not their constituents, just people around the country um, who are phoning again and again and again, or exposing, uh, offering the phone numbers of these 22 members of Congress so lots of people can, can call them. Um, the, the main point and the main thing that upsets me here is the fact that to a certain degree, what we're seeing is that it, it already is normalized. So as much as people are saying, don't normalize this, if the shared response to people who are not even necessarily on the right, right, people who I engage with occasionally on social media, people who might even agree with my politics and who are saying, well, yeah, that's what they do. That, on the one hand, yes. On the other hand, that's not normal. It never has been. It isn't now, but the difference now is in a sense, the institutionalization of violence. And, and the, the, the use of violence to try and create the speakership, to give the speakership to one particular person. That's beyond alarming. And that's so far past normal. That's in a sense what I wanted to say this morning. And this is why if you go back and look at my um, various social media accounts, you'll see me sort of in getting increasingly riled up at the fact that no one seems to see how this is a 
slightly different thing from the normal violence and what this suggests. I can't find people who are as upset as I am about what I'm seeing. You here, the History Matters community, you are the people that I could say, I'm upset. Um, I keep thinking of the movie Network. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm upset by this. This alarms me in a different way from the other violence. And part of what alarms me is the non-response, is the um, inability or unwillingness or whatever to notice the difference in this mode of violence versus the, the general violence that's been thrown all over the place. Um, in recent years. Um, the one other thing I'll note um, is that uh, sort of byproduct, part of the reason for what we're seeing is because um, some of those 22 members might be willing to work with Democrats and come up with a compromise, and um, that makes them a victim of more threats, right? That, that a certain part of the Republican Party believes seemingly in one party rule you're not allowed to engage with the other side. That's a dangerous thing too. We could talk about that on another episode, you know, one party rule, two party rule. But at any rate, think about that too, because the threats are born of the fact that some people seem willing to engage with someone on the opposite side of the aisle and come up with a solution and they're being threatened out of doing that. So basically one party is saying, no, we, it's us. It's us, and if you aren't with us, who knows what's gonna happen? Okay, so my, my takeaway, I always have a takeaway, and I suppose my takeaway this morning, more than anything else, is the degree to which I think we are all, things are, this is, violence is normalized to a degree that perhaps we don't all realize, and that I hadn't thought about in the way that I thought about it last night and this morning, when people wouldn't agree with me, that people threatening members of Congress to make them vote a certain way is beyond general violence, is, is institutionalized violence of a sort, is violence woven into our political process, or at least attempts to weave it into our political process in such a dangerous way. We can't allow that to be normalized. We can't accept that as, oh, well, it's what the other side does. It's beyond anti-democratic. It's a signal about what you probably will get if a certain kind of person gets power. If this is how people get power, what are they going to do once they have it? So I suppose I'm pleading in a way this morning, please don't accept what's happening now as more of what the right does. It Yes, there's been a lot of violence. And, and in the Q&A, we can talk about the left, um, because I saw this morning someone um, saying, you know, well, the left's been violent, and then you're, now we're going to act like them. It's like, <laughs> no. Um, you know, and then they point to Black Lives Matter, or they blame things that, you know, like, January 6th and say, no, it was really the, the left. This isn't to say that there are not people on the left who are sometimes violent, but as far as a, a campaign of violence, of threats and violence, we've been watching that. Specifically targeted violence against individuals to shut them up, that's been on the right. Okay, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna come down off my soapbox um, and I'm going to, um, okay, I had, I had my, notes above the um chat so i couldn't see the mug 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 but now oh okay yep they yeah. started mug mug, mug. i get the mug, mug mug started okay um this this was as close as i could come to today's topic and i think i think it, it suits um a conversation that's um about threats and people not behaving nicely towards each other um it says Funny, I don't recall asking for your opinion. <laughs> I love that whole series. Like they do notepads, mugs, I know, I know. post-it notes, and I just love that. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Jesse, no, it is not a new mug. I've used it before, but it's been, 
actually on a shelf that I had to climb a ladder to get. Um, but I think that perfectly suits. <laughs> we got the top shelf level mug this week, kids. <laughs> That's but Duran, just so you know, we've decided that they need to remake Back to the Future, but but with a, a female lead, which oh. is future Joanne Freeman, because you mentioned that twice and people love that. Oh. So we decide you're going to star in a remake and <laughs> you're the new Marty McFly. <laughs> Back to the Future historian brand, you know, I, I you know, but I, as I, I couldn't help but think, right, that if this happens and no one notices it and, and things happily march on, there will be a Joanne Freeman in the future, a historian yeah. in the future who will find will. this and be hey. like, holy smoke. Like, well, uh, what? So anyway, um, okay. I'm, well, I'm As you can imagine, the Q&A and the chat have been off the chain busy. So are you ready to jump in? Do you need to take a yeah, second first? Let's okay. Go. Um, our good friend Dave asks, any thought on if the apparent dysfunction by some um, Republican members in the House is an attempt to kneecap the function of Congress in general, um, what Bannon and others stated as their goal about a half a dozen years ago? NCHE did not have to sign me in, so I may be anonymous. <laughs> no, you're not, but somebody else is. So we got to resolve that, John, because I feel uncomfortable putting anonymous ones in. I don't know how you feel, Joanne. If you want me to read the anonymous ones, I will. But I don't know what to do. About a long time ago, we had said it, you had to kind of be a kind of own it. Right. So I mean, that's I, a real question. Yeah, I, I don't know, um, actually, don't what either. to do. Um, but anyway, his comment was about, are they trying to kneecap the function of Congress in general? Could be, you know, I mean, I can't say definitively, yes, they are. No, they aren't. Certainly, um, we hear the word chaos all over the place. Certainly, a state of chaos, you know, is one of the tried and true ways in which um, authoritarians or dictators get into power. You create chaos, you make things dysfunctional and everything gets bad to the point that people look to someone to correct the situation. And it's the dictator, the authoritarian who says, I can fix the situation. And people turn to that person, welcome that person in, and then the door is shut <laughs> behind them, that person. Um, the, the door of democracy is shut. So um, might that be part of what's happening? It could be. I don't know. I can't say that definitively. I wouldn't be surprised um, if there are some people who uh, would love for that to be the case. Certainly, as, as the person who asked the question suggests, some have been saying that that's the goal. But I can't be, I don't know. I can't be more specific than that. Okay. Um, our good friend, Linda Krauss, who joins us frequently as well, as Dave does, um, asks threats from the Republican base towards the Republican legislatures reminds me of another period in history, the French population turning on Robespierre after he was the one who started whipping them up in the beginning of the French Revolution. She's asking, is there another period in American history that this sort of reminds you of? Them kind of turning on the person that started it. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I always feel like, oh, an 18th and first half of the 19th century historian. Um, I would be interested in looking at the dynamics of the McCarthy era, mm. um, you know, and, and to see how sentiment turned because ultimately it did turn. Um, I, again, I don't, I, I, I think I spoke about it once or twice on a podcast. Um, and there was that very famous moment. Um, have you no sense of decency, sir, that, that, people saw and responded to that didn't single-handedly change things, but it sure helped. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of moments in which someone is extreme and pushes in a certain direction and then pushes too hard and people say, yep, that's too far. Um, but that's the one that springs to mind um, is McCarthyism and the degree to which that was extreme. Uh, and then the degree to which it seems at least some people said, yeah, okay, we've now gotten to a point where it no longer um, feels comfortable. It should never have felt comfortable, but where it gets to a point that people are actually willing to say stop. All right. Um, all right. The the one I posted anonymously. It's a good question. I don't think there was any ill intent. I think they might just be on like a different device or something. Um, so the question was: Can threats of violence cause people to stand up for what is right? 
And the example they give is the governor of Michigan received death threats. And then in the next election cycle, Michigan flipped after, you know, all three chambers after 40 years of being a red state, it became a blue state. And they're wondering if maybe that's the result, the threats of violence taking away reproductive rights, et cetera. You know, people finally said, you know what, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And they, so they're just wondering, like, if you could comment, is that something that you see as a pattern? Well, it, it certainly is very possible, right? That if you push too hard, too far, that at some point people are going to say, you know what? We've reached a breaking point. That's possible. The problem is you can't absolutely predict it. It, it may seem likely, but it, it, you know that's a risky thing. I do think it's very real and very possible that, um, and that's what a lot of um, these 22 Republicans, it's what a lot of them are saying right now is like, if you think really, actually one of them explicitly said, you think I'm going to back down in the face of that? I'm going to, I'm going to lean into the win, right? Like now I'm really never going to vote for Jordan. So I, I do think that it can sort of get people riled up and, and get them to stand up straight and fight back. I mean, I've also been um, skeeting, posting, tweeting, whatever, um, about Joshua Giddings, who's a great example of that. Um, someone who was an abolitionist, um, stood up again and again and again in the house to fight against slavery was, you know, threatened and attacked in any number of ways by Southerners physically. Um, and his response to that was, oh yeah, okay, bring it because I'm prepared, you know, not only that, but I'm really not going to back down. I, I know I talked in a previous episode about how he gets to Congress and he immediately says, I think, you know, our, our Northern friends, he calls them, our Northern friends are so timid. They're afraid of these other men. They're backing down. And along the lines of this question, his response is, okay. And I, I think explicitly, he says, I didn't plan on speaking in Congress at the beginning. I just got here. But that's changed now. Now I have a lot to say because that's not right. And I'm going to stand up. So it, it can have that effect. Um, but that's there are so many variables there um, that you have to kind of hope that if people push too hard in too violent and bad a direction, that enough people will be willing to stand up and say, no, um, we're at a breaking point. We also will think like we were at a breaking point like four years ago, but okay. Um, at any rate. So yes, I do think that that can be a pattern. All right, we have two Civil War era related questions, one from Francesca and one from Troy. So um, I'm going to sort of squish those together because we have so many. Um, <laughs> Francesca was wondering if violence was normalized in politics before the Civil War, and if so, how? And then um, Troy was asking, did the politicians in that era find a way to address those threats? So were they normalizing that and how did they, <laughs> Francesca made up a new word, unnormalized it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a clear word. Um, She's a writer. She can do that. <laughs> totally. Um, so the, one of the things to bear in mind about the period before the Civil War, the decades before the Civil War, is that that was a really, really violent period of time, apart from politics. There are a lot of books about mobbing and rioting um, from the Jacksonian period on. You know, I, I think in my book, I have a quote from my main character, uh, Benjamin Brown French, and he's, there's an election, maybe it's in the 1850s, and he says something like, hey, only three people died at the election this year. So, you know, that talk about, you know, that's, that's normalized. That's like, we expect people to die during elections because well, that's, that's kind of what happens. Um, I don't think that's necessarily just like, wow, politics is extreme. I actually think to some degree politics is representative. And one way you know that is by seeing what happens back home with some of the people in national politics um, who are extreme and then you watch them go home and the violence just continues. It was a violent period of time. Um, and, you know, Congress is representative. The fact that we're in a different kind of violent moment now does say something about us, does say something about the fact that it, to some degree we have said, yeah, yeah, everything's violent. That's what it's like. 
um, there's there's so much about this moment in time that future historians are gonna wow you know I just I think about that constantly <laughs> I do um, but at any rate I I I think that kind of answers that question right that that um, one of the differences is that that actually um, you can say that over time, over the long haul of time, that human nature has some similarities to it, that people might respond in a certain way to a certain kind of threat or a certain kind of moment. And I think that's true, but I think that the the differences of the past, of culture, of politics, of everything, that's important. It gets back to my earlier point. That's important. So you can't say it happened in 1850, so it's happening again. Yeah, but the, the world in 1850 was such a different place that that matters too. And, and the other question was, how did they deal with it? Um, well, you know, they, it, again, since that was a more violent period, certainly when you look at members of Congress, um, they didn't like it. They would speak up and say, the rules, someone must enforce the rules, you know, which basically didn't happen. Um, you know, it, it, it what, what it came down to more than anything else, individuals versus individuals. You couldn't count on um, the sergeant at arms to do something. Sometimes, you know, sometimes they would leap into the middle of a fray to try and calm it down. That didn't necessarily always work. Um, but I think it was a sort of every man for himself mode of dealing with it in Congress and probably to some degree, also very different in North and South, I will say, but to some degree, that's probably how violence was reckoned with at the time. <clears throat> okay, we've got so many questions. For what I, I know. And it's okay. okay, Andrew Langman asks, um, he says he knows that presidents and their families get secret service protection. Do members of Congress, and I'm also going to add judges to that question because I don't know if you guys saw, but a, a judge in Maryland, that was the first thing I saw this morning when I woke up on the news, was killed in his driveway last night, apparently. Um, so do do the members of Congress get Secret Service protection or they have to hire their own? How does that work? Does anybody know? I, I don't know for certain, but I believed what I was re have been reading in the last few days um, is that they've been getting, like mm. one member of Congress got someone to go with their child to school or something mm. like that. that um, so I don't know. I don't think they automatically get protection, secret service yeah. protection. I, I mean, within the Capitol, the Capitol Police are there, but outside, I actually don't know. And it sounds like, no, that is not automatic. I mean, so there's um, this one person who gave the recording she had of one of these threats to one of the networks, the wife of a member of Congress, <clears throat> excuse me, apparently is now sleeping with a loaded gun by her bed because she doesn't know what's going to happen. So that that doesn't sound like someone who knows that they have someone protecting them, but I don't know that for certain. I thought after Nancy Pelosi's husband was attacked, they did provide them at least for a while. Yeah, that with judges, I don't, I, yeah, it might be actually, and it might be with individual people, mm -hmm. maybe for certain periods of time, that would make sense, mm -hmm. but I don't absolutely know the answer to that. So Joanne, just so you know, a lot of teachers, you know, we have many teachers that tune in on Friday, um, Lois and others, but Lois said that this today, she really needed this today because her class has been asking questions about this specifically. So I thought you'd want to know that. Um, and Kara Lee, one of our other favorite teachers says, if violence is becoming normalized and woven and institutionalized into the political process, how do we unweave this and push against the normalization? And I think she's asking that from the teacher perspective too. Well, you know, boy, I wish um, I had the absolute answer to that. But part of the answer to that um, is doing precisely what we're doing here this morning, which is saying loudly, assertively, repeatedly, this is not normal. This is not how our government is supposed to work. This is not how Congress is supposed to work. This is not normal. Now, I totally understand. And I, as a you know teacher, think about this, too. Um, you can't and shouldn't say everything is fair and peachy and hunky dory and good, um, and then this is bad, right? Because that that's whitewashing, uh, you know, our world. We don't want to do that. We want to have pe students understand that sometimes you have to stand up for rights, and that rights have been violated in the past, and people stood up 
for those rights and that mattered, right? And I know so many teachers here are reckoning with this, like how do you um, how do you balance that? How do you, on the one hand, say what's happening now is bad, and on the other hand, say you know some version of it has happened before, so don't act like this is something new. Um, and I think I think that's valid. I think that's hard to balance. You know, um, I I think that you know any number of minority populations could say, yeah, well, you guys are experiencing what we've been experiencing for a really long time. Now, that. You know, as far as violence is concerned, uh, an ongoing threat of violence, yeah, that's true. But I think, I think um, circumstance matters. The moment matters. Who is being violent against who matters, and more than anything else, in the case of what we're seeing now, saying that that's not how our government is supposed to work. That's not how a democratic politics is supposed to work. You don't have to say this is new or unprecedented. It's just a simple fact. That's not how our government is supposed to work. That's not how a democratic politics works. And that matters. Yeah. Um, so our good friend Clinton, who um, joins us very often and sometimes makes the bingo cards now for us. <laughs> Clinton asks, as someone who has practiced nonviolence all of my life, it's personally distressing when people like me are targeted and then blamed for the threats against us. So he's he's wondering, you know, is there a way that we could address that aspect that people who've tried to present themselves as nonviolent then being the, the targets? I, I want to make sure I understand Dan, that I might not fully get that. I, I think um, what he's asking is, you know, he he himself tries to present himself like other historical figures as wanting to find solutions to these problems nonviolently, but then it seems that then they become the targets. I see. So he's I see. wondering if there's any other examples of that, and if you had any suggestions on that. Well, I mean, I I do think part of the answer to that um, is to expose it. Right. Part of the answer to that is to say, you know, I, I'm someone who wants to compromise. Um, I want to at least engage in conversation with people. I do not support the violence and people are now threatening me. Expose it. You know, I mean, there will be people who will say, whoa, like that's crossing a line. We're, we're, we're at a right at a moment now where, you know, I who the heck knows what's going to happen, but you certainly feel that there's at least a murmur of people saying, <laughs> wait a minute, this is going too far. We can't actually rely on the fact that that's going to have an impact and that's horrifying in and of itself. But I do think that's part of the answer is um, not accepting it and, and letting it remain secret, exposing it for what it is. There's no guarantee on what the response to that will be, um, but one would hope that the response to that, at least in part, would be people saying that's not fair, that shouldn't be happening, and, and making it an issue, calling it out so that it will not be as easy for someone to do that. Again, I, there are so many ways in which, um, I want to figure out how I want to put this. There are many ways in which doing the right thing uh, politically has risks that it might not have felt that it had before. Um, and I think that's a fact, um, but I don't think that's a reason to walk away. Um, and not everyone's the same and not everyone needs to stand up that in, in the face of that sort of stuff. I'm not making some like, you're a coward if you walk away. I'm not saying that at all. I just do think now, um, if you're if you're standing up against some of what's going on here among people who you know feel that for them the violence is normal, um, there are some risks involved. To me, that becomes the reason to stand up. Um, but again, um, everyone has to figure out for themselves what makes sense and what they want to do and how they want to do it. Um, but that's part of the impact of this climate. Right. Um, so James is asking, have threats always been underreported because elected officials don't want to appear worried about them or appear vulnerable? 
I think he means like to other nations. So do they do they purposefully underreport those sort of threats or acts of violence? Well, certainly in Congress they did, and it was for several reasons. Um, part of it was because um, reporters, the reporters uh, reporting on Congress, um, tended to get printing contracts from members of Congress. It was the government that gave them printing contracts, so they didn't want to make members of Congress look bad. Um, and so they just didn't, right? They're like, oh, which is, I've talked before about the weird, you know, the record says there was a sudden sensation in the corner. It doesn't say anything else. And it's like someone flipped a table and pulled a gun, you know, and the reporter doesn't want to say that. And occasionally when reporters did something, said something, printed something that a congressman didn't like, they would get beaten in the Capitol, actually on the least, probably more than one occasion. Mm -hmm. um, I forgot the original question now, though. What was the original question? They were wondering if they... Um, did that because they, they didn't want our government and our nation to appear vulnerable. Oh, 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 right. So some of it was fear. Um, some of it was probably not wanting the nation to think that things are in chaos. Um, I, I mentioned, I know a previous week after um, one member, a senator pulled a gun on another senator and they all like sat down to go back to work and someone <laughs> stood up and said, like New Hampshire congressman stood up and said, yeah, they're going to be thinking out there in the world that we're slaughtering each other. We need to call an investigation so that people understand that we've got things in hand and that it's not crazy and out of control, right? And everyone's like, yeah, that makes sense. Then the American public will feel like things are in control. So I think it's a mix of things. Um, and certainly, um, you know, we care, generally speaking, what foreign nations think of us, but at this moment, what they think of us and what we think of them is so complicated mm. that I, I can't even begin to untangle that. Yeah. So people are giving us live updates in the chat. Apparently there's a third vote going on now in the I, house. I thought it was going to so. start at 10, right? <laughs> I appreciated so. they're keeping us abreast of current events. We are discussing the ramifications of current events historically. Um, yeah. Okay. Lori asks, since... Jordan and the group supporting Jordan know that the votes aren't there for him to be speaker. Do you think the normalization of the behavior and obstruction of the House business is their desired strategy? So are they doing this deliberately to make trouble, basically? Mm -hmm. That's what um, she's saying. Well, you know, again, I don't have the answer to that. One way to reason this would be to say, um, with what's going on now, there are two ways in which that might have an impact. And we talked about it before, right? This might just create chaos and chaos is good in its own kind of way. Or you could also say, if I keep pushing and keep pushing sooner or later, people are gonna give. Um, and we don't know what pushing means right now. Either one of those things I suppose would be possible. So perhaps that's a win-win situation. It's just that now I'm very interested to watch now the, the public response, the response of Republican members of Congress, um, the press, the fact that uh, I don't remember which press outlet was talking about hardball politics made me want to punch a wall. Um, you know, again, the normalization of this, I don't even know what to do with that. Um, it's not just more of the same violence. Yes, <laughs> there's a lot of violence and it is more of the same, but it's different in a way that, that really matters. And we are at the moment voting on whether to give power to someone who seemingly isn't aggressively um, fending off that kind of behavior, who seems to, in his manner, support that kind of behavior. But again, um, we're deciding if this person should have a lot of power second in line to the president. And that's the violence is affecting that choice. Um, and again, the, the, the normal, it is not normal um, beyond the fact that it's violent. <clears throat> All right, we've got so many questions. We're never going to get to all of them. There's 17 more questions. That's crazy. Oh, wow. I think this might be a record. John, you might have to double check that for us. But um, okay, so our beloved Miriam, who's the greatest textile professor ever, um, she says, 
she wanted to know about attacks of violence. You know, we we know that's always been part of history, and it's as horrendous as it is. It seems like now it's more attacks on institutions. And she's mm -hmm. asking, you know, in the future, how might scholars, historians, legal experts discuss how to reinforce the Constitution? Like, who's monitoring attacks on institutions, right? And not not just people, right? Well, and that's a good question. Um, Certainly, I do think, um, you know, in the last um, six years, um, there has been a deliberate attempt to undermine uh, political institutions to, you know, make them seemingly disreputable or unbelievable in some way to erode uh, um, national centers of power um, in some way to make it easier for people who are not in that national center to have some power. So we've been watching um, our in institutions of various kinds be chipped away at and, and eroded. I think that's been a long term, um, I don't want to call it a strategy, but let's say strategy, right? It's, it's been something that's been happening consistently. Um, how do we stop that? Well, this is so this is one of the interesting things about this moment in time is enforcement. Um, and I don't mean that in a like enforcement way, but what I mean is um, it's one thing to think that something is wrong or know that something is wrong. But just saying that something is wrong and actually doing something to hold someone accountable when they have done something wrong. I've said this a lot of times before. We live in an era um, that's a crisis of accountability in which people don't feel that they should be held accountable for what they do. And sometimes they think, you know, uh, you know, no, I, I, why blame me? This is, again, this is the way things are. Um, sometimes people don't want to admit that they've done something wrong. Um, sometimes they assume they're entitled to get away with what they want to get away with. Um, and when you don't hold someone accountable, again, not in a vengeful kind of way, not in an ad hoc kind of a way, but you judge if what they're doing is um, allowable under the rules, give them whatever kind of a hearing they deserve, and then decide that they should be held accountable for what they do, that really matters. And if you don't hold people accountable, you're opening a free-for-all, right? Why should people feel that they need to be accountable for anything if even people who really obviously cross lines are never held accountable, right? And that's in my um, podcast with Heather and here before too, I think, and, and I believe in one of the op-eds that I wrote. Um, I talk about how one of the vitally important things about hearings isn't necessarily their outcome. It's the simple fact that they happen because the hearing is people saying a line has been crossed. So now we're gonna have a hearing about that. Regardless of what happens in the end, the hearing signals that there is a line and that that line has been crossed. That matters a lot. I, I think if I, you know, if, if the word I say most is contingency, number two is accountability, man, because um, that's huge. And that echoes everywhere these days. Yeah. <laughs> All right, it's a little after 11. There's several more questions. Cool. Um, let's try one more um, at least, and then we'll see what. Okay. Um, this one comes from Kay. She says, it's interesting to see how much disruption can be caused by just a small number of people. So for example, a very small group that's holding up the vote for a speaker. And then she says, you know, there's, it's typically, two or three people trying to ban a hundred library books. So she was wondering if, you know, a single woman going after another person's right to choose, those sorts of things. Who or what could give that McCarthy moment in our current climate, she's wondering. She feels like it's a very tiny group that seems to wield all this power over things like book banning and the house, you know, speaker and that sort of thing. Why well, do we love that phenomenon, she's asking. Right, well, so that, Maybe that's a good last question. Um, that circles back on something that I've said a lot everywhere, right? Even though it seems that in our current climate, uh, with the direction that things are going, even among people of power, 
that our voice doesn't matter, that our that pushback doesn't matter, that resistance doesn't matter. It really, really, really matters because if a handful of people can get books banned in multiple states, a handful of organized people can expose it and resist it and have an impact, right? So I, I do think, I think generally speaking, this government, um, our, our democratic republic, that this versus a monarchy, one of the things that differentiates our government from a monarchy is that public opinion really matters. And that goes all the way back to the founding era. I've re written about that before. I think in my first book, maybe I talk about that some. So yes, that's like a general idea that's true, but it's, it's true in fact and in, in person right now that if people speak up, and they make enough of a fuss, sometimes that actually has an impact and people backpedal. So, you know, it isn't an, a solution, it isn't an answer, but it's a reminder that speaking up, pushing back, push back politics a week or two ago um, can really matter. Uh, and we're watching how a handful of individuals making trouble can have a big impact. There's good trouble too, John Lewis. Um, and a handful of people can fight against the erosion of our government or you know, any number of other things that are just inherently wrong with what's going on in politics now. Okay. We still have nine questions that we'll never get to, but maybe John, can you send the full chat since I logged in at the last minute later on, you could send me the full chat and also send us the questions we didn't, didn't get to maybe. Yeah, maybe that would be good. Come in next week. Like you did. A yeah. We can see what they are and, and yeah. whether that will help shape whatever okay. we talk about next week. Um, so, Okay. So a few minutes late, but um, here's what's going to happen now. Um, we are going to go to the after party. What that means is that we will no longer be recording what's going on here uh, so that we can be even freer and easier in our conversation. We can talk about whatever we want to talk about. Um, if you beamed in through the NCHE website, stay right where you are and poof, you will be in the after party. Um, if you are watching on Facebook, you need to leave Facebook and go to ncheteach.org slash conversations. ncheteach.org slash conversations. Um, I want really, I know every week I'm like, thank you for engaging in the conversation of democracy. Um, it matters in different ways to me every week. Last week, I, having the community here um, in the face of newbie not being here mattered. But this week, I'm so angry about what's happening and so upset about the fact that it seems normal to people that knowing that there's a community here where we could talk about this and we can discuss this and it can be a conversation and it 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 we can make it not just us independently standing around. You know, the fact that here's a community of people where I could explain to you why I'm very alarmed about this particular kind of threat that's in and of itself, that's powerful and meaningful. And, you know, however many people are, are here or on Facebook or are going to bring this or watch this later, bring this to other people, along the lines of what we just said about, you know, a handful of people can make a difference. A handful of people can make a difference. So the fact that we can be here and say what we just said, you know, what I just said, this isn't normal. Talk about the conversation of democracy. That's that's a big part of democracy, being able to point and say, people threatening members of Congress to get a particular person as speaker, that's really, really not normal. That's a big in your face threat to democracy in a different kind of way. So anyway, I wanna thank you for being here for this kind of conversation, for being, um, a civil group of people, a community where we can come together and have these kinds of conversations on a purely personal level for giving me a place to vent when I'm really upset about politics <laughs> because I know that we're going to have a conversation here, but that really matters. The fact that we can have that conversation is is pretty wonderful uh, and is a, a sort of uh, 
is testimony to democracy and why it matters. Okay, um, I am going to say thank you to Annie and John. Um, I am going to say, uh, for those of you who will not stick around, um, have a wonderful week. Uh, keep your eyes open uh, to see what's happening because we just have no idea what is happening at all. Um, and, you know, speak up. Contact members of Congress, contact members of Congress who aren't your member of Congress, you know, and uh, do not contact them and be threatening. Contact them and say, you know, here's why this is a problem. If you get, you know, I think one member of Congress said, a Republican, there are 20,000 phone calls that he has not gotten around to answering yet. Um, anyway, uh, I will stop uh, since I'm riled up and um, I will see you guys next week. Okay.